On this episode of the Medusa Metacast, Gorgons and Statues. Let's dive in. Welcome to the first full-length episode of the Medusa Metacast. I am Matthew, and I'm hoping that we can have some fun this episode with some storytelling. I wanted to tell you that this episode isn't indicative of the sort of material that I'll be releasing on a regular basis, as that will be far less about storytelling in a literal sense. But if you like archetypal stories and their interpretations, then I hope I can amuse you for this episode. Moving forward, expect far more discussion on philosophy and reason. But without further ado, let's start with story time. I experienced a lot of consternation trying to name this podcast, as you need to ensure you have an original name, not only for listeners to distinguish between yours and another, but also to respect copyright laws. Then there is the matter of whether or not the market is already saturated with words or concepts that you'd like to have in your title, and how this sits with you. There is no shortage of the word Medusa in podcasting, or in pop culture in general. And to my dismay, there is another podcast with the play on words Metacast in its title. So unsurprisingly, in a world filled with so many creative people, being the first to combine two words to make a new one is a rare occurrence. In brief, I will touch on the word Metacast, because I'd like to spend most of this episode discussing the story of Perseus and Medusa. You may have guessed that it is a combination of the words meta and podcast, but what might be meant by the word meta? Well, it depends on what word follows it, but a few I enjoy tend to be meta-truth, meta-game, metaphysical, and metacast, uh, the last one being obvious. What does it mean for something to be meta? Well, it generally means for something to make reference to itself, but not in a traditional manner of speaking. Some things may be true, and it would be difficult to profess their falsity without seeming fallacious or foolish. But for something to be meta-true, it could be construed as being true, but not in the conventional sense of how other things may be true. A game is one thing, but a metagame is a version of the game that exists within the game itself, typically one that has arisen as a natural process intrinsic to the game itself. If something were to be described as having physical properties, then we generally consider it to be comprised of matter in one way or another. But something that is metaphysical would be something that seems to exist just as much as a physical object does, like a table. But itself may not be comprised of matter, like knowledge for instance. A metacast is a podcast, and it will have discussions and interviews just like any other but it will also be a mechanism through which anything that can be dissected will be done so in a fearless and hopefully constructive manner, something that podcasts may not always do. It is in this way that I am hoping to magnify the small number of voices that are currently trying to have important and mature conversations in an era hell-bent on exposing the silent majority to childish behavior and perpetrating an environment where mental energy is spent on the lowest common denominator. And I say this as someone who is a nobody, just like everyone else. I try my best to actually follow Gandhi when he suggested that we be the change we want to see in the world. Despite the commonality of Medusa, and my unoriginal adaptation of the term metacast and podcasting, I decided that after thinking of the litany of other names, I settled on a combination of the two, for a variety of reasons. First, I am a philosopher and though virtually every ancient culture engaged in some sort of formalized thinking at one point or another, it is most frequently associated with ancient Greece, and the word philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, which means love of wisdom. And even then, it's a compound word, but I'll end my digression there. This isn't a podcast on etymology. I'm also a great appreciator of storytelling, not only the sorts that we share with one another and transcend the boundaries of time and culture, but also the sort that the left hemisphere of your brain engages in when it creates narratives and imprints language onto your memories, and by extension, your thoughts. Stories are an inseparable feature of human existence, but that being said, some stories are bad, or just wrong, 
and there is a great amount of variety in the quality of their interpretations and applications. It is in this way that we are all at least equal insofar as our dependence on stories, but stories aren't created equal, and which ones you use to formulate your beliefs and translate them into action are subject to the scrutiny of all of humanity. And why shouldn't they be? There is no such thing as an immunity from your responsibility to make sense in a way that can be articulated so that other humans can recognize it as making sense. Anything else is a fallacy or a tantrum. I named my website after my Greek grandfather as an homage not only to a great man, but also to remind people that if you don't find ways to immortalize the best versions of our imperfect existence, then why should anyone value doing great things? It is curious to me that there was so much controversy about the toppling of statues in the last few years, not because I am a proponent of their removal, not at all. In fact, the point of people and events being immortalized so that they are in constant view of a community is so that they may all have an effect on how we shape our interpretations of the world. Whether you believe a statue to represent someone heinous or someone worthwhile, they serve to remind you not of their legacy, but of the legacy that any human can leave, one of imperfection, but hopefully at least 51% decent. History is like this. We don't learn history to see what other people did before us. We do it to remind us what we're all capable of given the right circumstances. You're not as good as you think you are. And if one day a statue is erected of you, and you're someone who thinks we can destroy whatever it is we don't like, I'm sure you'll support anyone who wishes to topple it because of your past indiscretions. Like, for instance, destroying property you find offensive. Statues can inspire you if the story you've applied to it is inspiring. And it can offend you if the story you've applied to it is offensive. But that doesn't make the statue something other than what it is. It's just a statue, after all. Rather, it tells you something about yourself, for instance, what you value, or what you despise. Regardless of which one it is, the statue has done its purpose, to assist you in finding something redeeming in your own humanity, or something you should remember to avoid. Destroying a statue is an act justified by the guilty of conscience, unable to be confronted by their own humanity whilst they become the worst of it. I honor my grandfather for his positive qualities, so I am reminded of what to pursue but I surround myself equally with things that warn me of their catastrophe so that I don't forget that evil dawns a human face. And it usually looks just like you. So then, I am throwing my hat into the Medusa fan club for what I believe are potentially interesting reasons. And that was a little story I shared with you there. Like I said, I like stories. I suppose we'll see whether or not I'm worthy of the value that being woven with it can offer. Medusa is a very recognizable character in Greek mythology, and like any compelling story character, there have been plenty of interpretations and attributions made to her as an abstraction. The thing is, I don't find any of them particularly compelling. I can't help but feel like the idea of having a vicious serpentine female with a stone gaze was selected first because of how fucking cool Medusa is, and she certainly is. And then would-be theorists attached features that serve their preconceived notions in a relatively transparent way. And they are not alone, because I'm going to do more or less the same thing. The distinction here is that I don't have a particularized endgame. I prefer to interpret and adapt stories to as widespread an audience as possible. That is, all of humanity. Stories survive in the hearts and minds of people due to their ubiquitous and resonant nature, and I don't believe the best level of analysis for why certain stories survive the ages is to narrow their applicability down to a preferred subset of people for your own narrative. That's cheating. My views on the value of Medusa as an abstraction can vary, of course, as it depends on what the story is being used for in any given situation, but the aspects of it I'd like to focus on for the purposes of the podcast are her dangerous nature, how she came to be killed, and her legacy. While virtually every aspect of every story can be disagreed upon, it is often confusing how it is we find ourselves arguing over the details of a false event. It didn't really happen, after all. Medusa isn't real. 
well, at least not in any physical way. She is certainly real within some framings, but not in the way my dinner table is real. Maybe she is real in the way that the idea of my dinner table is real. Ideas are real, aren't they? Um, ideas are kind of curious things. So then, what is it that someone can really be right or wrong about in regards to Medusa? But that's also kind of the point, isn't it? We have a sense that stories should play out a certain way, and suggestions that offer such insights will inevitably be traced back in some way to our values, whether they be writ small and personal, or writ large and universally applicable. It's like an excellent song that is beloved by many, but for different reasons. A single song with a character and complexity with meaningful and mysterious lyrics can haunt you for the rest of your life. But the brilliance of any song lies in the timelessness of its message when it has become its own entity beyond that of its creator. For those unfamiliar with Medusa, she is known to be one of three Gorgon sisters, and the only mortal one among them. They were monstrous creatures said to have the body of a serpent and a head covered in writhing snakes whose gaze turned any living thing to stone. Beyond that, the details of the Gorgons start to diverge quite a bit, depending on which story you've come to know. There are ones that indicate that Medusa was the only one with a stone gaze, those that describe her as a human female prior to her transformation by the goddess Athena, as punishment for what is described as a seduction by Poseidon in some versions, and a rape in others. There are also versions that have Medusa be reborn as a human female after her beheading by Perseus. Those Greek gods and weavers of woe, always murdering and raping, starting wars, and betraying one another. And their proclivity for using humans as pieces on the chessboard, fit only to be moved by the hand of a god and were sacrificing in the pursuit of winning. Essentially, they're like the modern era elite, generally ineffective, each with their own domains and talents, living on a mountain far above the realm of normal humans, looking down with eyes oblivious to the fact that if it weren't for the rabble beneath, they'd have dominion over nothing. But then why do you treat us with such contempt? This isn't a mystery, by the way. There are plenty of reasons why untouchables have disdain for precisely what defines them in such a manner, perhaps for another day. The point is, the Greek gods were assholes, and there is no shortage of questions that could be asked as to what might have motivated them in any given circumstance. It really depends on which lesson it is you're hoping to learn, or teach. What is it that any of us are to do when we find ourselves merely as pawns of the gods? What to do indeed? Something that is compelling about the Greek gods, however, is how much more like real people they are compared to the gods of other widely celebrated and supported religions. They're what humans would be like if they were gods, sort of like how the show The Boys depicts what humans might be like if they were given superpowers. These provide a glimpse into how power corrupts, and how absolute power corrupts absolutely. Let's see what we can learn about humanity from the story of Perseus and Medusa. Polydectes wished to marry Perseus' mother, Danae, but Perseus was very protective of his mother, and Polydectes feared he would interfere with any pursuit of her hand. Believing that no one could face Medusa and live, he conspired and successfully tricked Perseus into slaying Medusa and returning with her head as a wedding gift. Unbeknownst to many, however, is that Perseus was the son of Zeus, who had impregnated Danae after being locked away by her father. And so, the stage is set. Perseus was a poor and modest man, but knew well enough about Medusa, and that she was a terrifying creature and her lair should be avoided at all costs. To trespass into the belly of the beast was a fool's errand. Unknown to Perseus, it was foretold that he would kill Acrisius, his grandfather and the king of Argos, and the gods become somewhat irritated, when mere mortals attempt to interfere with their decrees. Acrisius had already attempted to kill Danae and Perseus by locking them in a wooden chest and casting them into the sea, but they had been saved by Dictus, the brother of Polydectes. Just so we're clear here, because I know I'm throwing a lot of similar sounding names at you, and it may be the first time you've heard them before, but basically, a king tried to kill his daughter and grandson because of a prophecy. 
And when they were saved by a stranger, the stranger's brother plotted to kill the grandson because he wanted to bang his mom. Ancient stories were soap operas before television was invented. Perseus, a man bound by an offer of any gift Polydectes could name, did not renege on his offer even when it was likely certain death to retrieve such a thing from an island that none dare approach. The island was named Sarpedon, often referred to as the end of the earth, an island populated by the blind, who could not be turned to stone by Medusa's gaze. Perseus had every intention of keeping his word, and begun to make plans for his travel to the island of Sarpedon, where he would likely face his death. However, because it had already been decided by the gods that Perseus was to carry out a king-slaying prophecy, they took a keen interest in his quest to obtain the head of Medusa, and took steps to assist him. After all, his failure would introduce doubt into the authority of the gods being law, and gods hate being challenged. They demand obedience. Perseus was given a pair of winged sandals by Hermes, a cap of invisibility by Hades, an adamantine sword by Zeus, and a metallic pouch by the Hesperides. Additionally, he was given a shield by Athena, polished to a mirror finish, who took particular interest in assisting Perseus, her disdain for Medusa known to all. Wearing the winged sandals, he flew to the cave of Medusa. Wearing the cap of invisibility, he was able to hide from the immortal sisters of Medusa. Welding the shield, he was able to approach the sleeping Medusa without looking at her directly. He beheaded the sleeping Medusa with the adamantine sword, and he placed her head in the special pouch, capable of keeping it safe on his return. As the lifeless body of Medusa lay there, Pegasus, the winged horse, and Chrysior, a man welding a golden sword, sprang forth from her severed neck, the offspring of Poseidon and Medusa. Quite an unusual way to give birth, I suppose, and here I thought that human birth was rife with unpredictability and trauma. Well, where the story progresses from here depends on which version you've heard, two of which are potent but in significantly different ways. One has Perseus attend the crowded court of Polydectes upon his return, and when not a soul would believe he had slain Medusa and was therefore not only a dishonorable man but also a liar, he retrieves the head from the pouch and holds it high above his head, and the naysayers who gazed upon it in disbelief return to stone, the power of a gorgon still present in her head. A noisy and boisterous court, having just received Perseus upon his return, had now been turned into a silent and still loose arrangement of statues, perhaps due to a reasonable demand of evidence in the face of an incredible feat, or perhaps due to their own shameful desire to engage in the ridicule of an honest man who did what none thought possible. Both are plausible and palatable to human nature. Another version has Perseus weld the head of Medusa to kill the Cetus, a giant sea serpent and scourge of the seas that Poseidon kept deep in the profound of the sea. A monster believed to be unstoppable, turned to stone by the head of another. The Greeks aren't without their irony, a concept that almost seems alien in modern times, much to our detriment. If you can't recognize irony for what it is, and notice the embedded humor in the insanity of life, you may stop seeing the ridiculousness of your own thoughts and actions, and when you lose your humor, the only thing left is anger. My mother still reminds me to this day, Maddie, sometimes if you don't laugh, you'll cry. I tend to agree. So that's the story. Some version of it anyway. But what does it mean? And why do I give a shit? And why do I think it's worth sharing? Let's take a dive into the deep end. I want you to consider a situation where you had to make a decision between two choices, where the outcomes are not only different, but there are incredibly high stakes involved. I am certain you can think of a situation like this in your life, past or present, that fits the bill. These decisions are very difficult to make. They can involve the hearts and minds of more than one person. They can involve health, money, stability, opportunity, integrity, and all sorts of things that complicate human affairs and make them horrible, but also the only reason worth living. What are we to do? Well, I have a personal axiom that has always served me well, 
and it is that whichever choice is the one you least want to make, it's the correct one. People are naturally averse to conflict, and when you combine that with a natural cowardice that many of us possess, tough choices are rendered easy by reducing the decision to one of two outcomes generally, which is, whichever one is the easiest one to make, or whichever one benefits me the most right now, neither of which are particularly good predictors of morality, nor of long-term happiness. The reason I'm going through this little thought experiment, I suppose you could call it, is because I want you to think about Medusa and what she represents. She is a formidable monster, one that strikes fear into the hearts of everyone, but also who is currently posing no threat to you, far away on an island to which she was banished. Not only was she banished there, but she was placed there deliberately, and not just by anyone, by the goddess of wisdom, Athena, where she lives among the blind, who cannot see her for what she is, and by virtue of their lack of vision, are immune to what she threatens. A dynamic I find cute, yet poignant. How is it that Perseus found himself in a situation where he is expected to travel to an island at the end of the earth, where none dare approach, inhabited by a fearsome monster that will almost certainly result in his death? Perhaps it is because of his sensibility that he attended a wedding to which he was invited, and when he arrived, he was humbled at being informed that everyone attending required a gift. The honorable thing to do was to provide a gift that he believed would be acceptable, but instead, to save face and demonstrate his willingness to acquiesce, he offered to get any gift they so desired, and when a gift most foul and dangerous was requested, he did not withdraw, nor did he negotiate. He simply accepted. Or maybe, it was none of these things. Whether or not this was a decision made out of self-preservation, pride, or naivete, it illustrates that, despite which sort of person you are, even the son of Zeus, you will have the clever and the ambitious place you in situations where you aren't privileged with easy decisions. It may be a matter of do or die, whether it be literally or figuratively. The difficult beckons us towards it, preying on our knowledge of its truth. And so we avoid it, opting for what may be easier, all the while justifying to ourselves that we are victims of circumstance. The truth is, to some extent, we're right. We are all victims of circumstance, but we're also cowardly. So we split the difference and ignore the latter so we can maintain a feeling of righteousness. I encourage you to be brave, even while being a victim of circumstance, because although you may be a victim of one sort, it is not deserving of the special sort of woe we embody so that we can absolve ourselves of doing the right thing. Even when it's not fair, and even when someone thrusts us into an impossible situation, the right thing to do doesn't change because of our sense of injustice at it. Don't let vengeance do the talking. Show yourself, and by extension everyone, that you have the courage to walk into the belly of the beast and do what everyone else is too afraid to do. Be careful that what it is you plan on beheading is indeed a monster, though, and not that which you've made into one, so you may slay something, anything, as an antidote for your sense of helplessness. Let's say you figure that out. The monster you're pursuing is indeed a monster, how is it that you can be certain it's worthy of slaying? And what can you expect will happen if you're successful? And if you fail? There is a risk of uncertainty both in your success and the outcome, and this is true of all pursuits, even those with high stakes and possessing mortal danger. Risk is a feature of existence, and only the foolish believe themselves capable of its erasure, and due to its ubiquity, Risk is never a reason to avoid a challenge. If you believe a situation to be absent of risk, it is a testament of your ignorance, and not one that the situation is safe. If this monster is nearby, within your grasp, then it's a testament of your cowardice in allowing it to exist and flourish unchallenged. And that's why monsters and stories are always somewhere that cannot be so easily accessed, the justification for both the validation of our lack of action and the mechanism by which we can be called to adventure. The worst monsters lay distant and dormant, beyond the realm of immediacy, whether by design or desire, 
and the journey is as treacherous as the route to treasure. Medusa isn't alone either. Her sisters reside with her, and she be avoided at all costs because some monsters cannot be slain. They are immortal. Life has many immortal monsters, many of which find their homes in our lesser natures. I've often thought that the main contributors of evil are often those who have a combination of the belief that they themselves are free from this taint, which is birthed from their lack of self-awareness, and the belief that they also have a responsibility to identify and defeat the tainted, which is birthed from their self-righteousness. How common it is that we manifest monsters in the pursuit of those we may slay. The sisters of Medusa, Theno and Uriel, are monsters to be sure, but Medusa has the unfortunate, or perhaps fortunate, trait of being mortal. In stories just as in life, only the lost and misled try to mount the heads of immortals. It is the wise that seek to defeat that which can actually be conquered. Only those at profound odds with reality will resent it enough to bring about its destruction. Bearing the head of Medusa, you can carry a piece of the sisters with you, and return from the darkness not having conquered an immortal, but with a trophy of your encounter to the end of the world. Then there is the matter of Medusa's gaze. What do you think you would do if you found yourself in the midst of a real monster, and its eyes met yours? Medusa is a sort of monster whose gaze can turn any living thing to stone. Equipped with this knowledge, would that discourage you from further meeting her? Do you think you have what it takes to face a real monster? Have you even met a real monster? Would you know if you did? What do you see when you look at other people? What do you see when you look in the mirror? When we are confronted with something that threatens our mortality, everything comes to a standstill, and we are forced to pause and assess our next move, because it may be our last. We behave in an incredibly similar fashion when ideas we hold are confronted with something threatening, an observation that continues to sadden me in its predictability and its implications. People will hold tightly to what they believe as if their existence was predicated on it. This just isn't true. And I would go so far as to say that I know this to be true, not that I believe it, and I am aware of the delineation. I will be tearing the mind away from the idea in the future, but for now I'll simply state, we are far more than our ideas, and though we acquire and integrate them throughout our lives, the sense of identity you feel with an idea was stitched together by human hands and following a pattern designed for utility or survival. If you encounter fabric more colorful and durable than the one you've wrapped yourself in, you'd best learn how to sew, because it's time for an upgrade. If you approach confrontation this way, then you will embrace the gaze as it erodes and renders useless that which you previously depended upon. Then, there's the matter of actually being capable of finding and killing her, neither of which is particularly easy. Unfortunately for us, winged shoes and caps of invisibility do not exist at least not in any functional sense, and even if we find physical monsters to slay, shiny shields and special bags probably won't help much. A sword could be useful, but we would probably disagree about how it is to be used, and whether the sword is literal. Perseus certainly had a lot of help, but it was provided by the gods, who had already decided his fate. Fate is a curious thing. It is certainly comforting for something to be meant to be, but this raises all sorts of questions about what meaning even is. What does it mean for something to be fated? According to what? The will of the gods? So, in that instance, there is a choice being made, it's just not by us. Is that justice? Does justice have anything to do with meaning? Stories would indicate that we believe they have a lot in common. That's why the phrase, the moral of the story, exists. Whether or not fate exists, one of the messages in the story is that in order to do something great, besides making the correct sacrifices, we require gifts, or perhaps, assistance of some kind. Humans aren't born with the same skills or talents, nor to the same degree of proficiency. Something that I actually cannot quite believe still, 
has become controversial to say in modern times. I suppose Orwell was right when he claimed that the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Orwell was right about a lot of things, and so were lots of people in history. It's curious how the wisdom of the past never seems to come up in conversations in an era where we seem to be running on a deficit of meaning and substance. Gifts and assistance can easily be rebranded as talents and supports. Do you think that those who have achieved a level of success in any given endeavor are lacking in talent and support? In his book, Discrimination and Disparities, Thomas Sowell does an excellent job providing well-articulated examples of how successful people on average do not possess one or two traits. It is rather a combination of the perfect sets of traits, opportunities, and timing that gives someone a chance to be successful. Is slaying a monster any different? We want to stand a chance against Medusa, and she doesn't seem like the diplomatic type. It is possible I could distract her with my sick dance moves and strike while she's averting her eyes, a tactic that anyone who has seen me dance would likely support. But I digress. Assuming I have a problem, a seemingly insurmountable one that my dance moves won't solve, how am I going to recognize the right thing to do and then manage to follow through on its execution, assuming that it will both be challenging and personally taxing? Well, having some natural talent at navigating stressful situations is valuable, but unfortunately, it isn't something many of us possess. Personally, I struggled for a very long time facing difficult things, but like anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. It's amazing how hard things become easy with practice, or perhaps amazing is the wrong word, because everything becomes easier with practice, generally. A feature of our existence as adaptive animals, you would say. Let's just say it's amazing anyhow. You know what? Just so we feel accomplished, okay? I got you, fam. What are some of the things that may assist us in navigating the tumultuous waters of life that cause us to lose our footing in search of a solid pillar to grab? What would make a good pillar if you built a house, presumably one that you would want to live in yourself, and one you labored over for a long time? What sorts of supports would you want to use? Would you want elegant and narrow spindles that are easily toppled and require constant maintenance and frequent replacing? Or would you want weathered and solid beams that have demonstrated their worth and only get stronger with experience? This may seem like an obvious decision, but we often reach for the sweet immediacy of sipping from shallow waters rather than diving down and drinking from the substantial depth below. This is an excellent strategy from an evolutionary point of view, but it doesn't offer the sort of long-term advantages offered as a result of a pricier cost of admission. What might some of these sturdy pillars be made from? Or rather, what may they represent insofar as traits, skills, or perspectives that we can adopt and develop in order to keep our house in one piece and protect us during a hurricane, keeping in mind that no one is immune from the poor weather that life brings? Let's examine these gifts that the gods provided to Perseus in his journey. Perseus has been tasked with seeking out and slaying Medusa, who poses as the obstacle standing between him and his exoneration from public and personal dishonor. The journey is treacherous and long, and winged sandals that provide the gift of flight will make the trip much easier. We don't have winged shoes, though, but something we can develop over time is the constitution to stay on course, despite the difficulty or length. Continuing to pursue your goal can be difficult, especially when the route challenges your motivation and causes you to reevaluate the value of your pursuit, and whether you have what it takes to make it to the finish line. The uncertainty of life can frequently eat away at the motivations we possessed at the commencement of any journey. Common terms that are used to describe an individual's ability to withstand the trials of life and keep moving forward are grit and resilience. Some of us are naturally grittier or more resilient than others, but anyone can work on improving this. We cannot prepare the road for us, but we can certainly prepare ourselves for the road ahead. In the absence of flying footwear, hope to possess the constitution to survive any journey 
regardless of the hazards. And if you don't, take steps to improve your resilience. You can rarely predict when the comfort of your life will conspicuously slip away. All right, so let's say we possess the gift of resilience, and we may believe ourselves capable of making it to our destination. But there are still things that may lead to failure. How often have you spent time in dark places where beasts reside? Do you know what to expect? Medusa has sisters, and they won't be particularly welcoming, especially since you intend on leaving with the head of their sibling. Which pitfalls are there that you may encounter along the road that will ensure your failure? Some monsters have a lot in common, and you may confuse your target with another. Thano and Uriel are immortal, trifle with the wrong sister, and you will forfeit your life. Even if you somehow manage to find a way to defeat an immortal, that wasn't your objective. It's a step in the right direction, but now isn't the time to claim victory. I've noticed that we're fond of setting out to do great things, and particularly fond of announcing these intentions to others. Additionally, we have a fondness for failing spectacularly at the great things we set out to do, modifying our initial goal to the point at which we failed, and then announcing our success to everyone, and hoping they don't notice our sleight of hand. This is often referred to as moving the goalpost, a maneuver favored by politicians and those who pray at the altar of public relations. It would be lovely to have a cap of invisibility in order to simply sneak by the obstacles that stand in our way, but perhaps there is something else we can use if we don't happen to have such an object. Are you familiar with criminal profiling? It is a fascination of mine, and clearly many others, if the popularity of crime-themed movies and television are any indication. One way of looking at pathological criminals is that they are mysterious and dangerous in a way foreign to someone of sound mind, which is why we find them so captivating. They are fictional evil manifest real. Another way of looking at pathological criminals, which is how I generally tend to view them, is that any of us could be one, given the right circumstances, likely due to a particular set of brain chemistry and aggravating factors. Regardless of which way you perceive them, it is undeniable that they are human, and familiarizing yourself with what humans are capable of provides insight into what it is you are. As I touched on earlier, history is similar in this way. One way of looking at history is that it is documentary evidence of the spectrum of human behavior. The evil that saturates human history isn't about fictional characters, nor is it about other people. It is about you and I, and learning how it is that we become perpetrators and villains is imperative if you care at all about morality and ethics. As we familiarize ourselves with the villainous, the commonalities between them become compellingly clear to the extent that we can recognize not only a pattern among them, but one that stretches across the border between us and them. If you don't see it, then you're either deliberately averting your eyes or you aren't looking hard enough. Once we've discovered this imaginary line in ourselves, we can survey the ends and learn how to walk about the shadows we cast. Be careful, though, for whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster, and I'll provide the remainder of that quote later on. The point is, we can, in essence, become invisible, or unlikely to be targeted, by the threats of other monsters by taking on monster-like features that will act as a ward and keep them at bay. We may not be able to sneak past as Perseus did, but we can stroll by with a presence that will demonstrate to predators that we are not their prey, because you possess the knowledge of what makes someone dangerous, and you will have the will to weld it should the need arise. This gift is clearly complicated, and cannot be described so succinctly as the previous. After a significant amount of fair and honest introspection, the sort that drives at parsing our presuppositions and the truth of our existence, we obtain a degree of self-awareness. As we become more comfortable with our own humanity, we can begin to map the territory in a way that provides definition and boundaries, and it begins to take shape. At this point, we can begin to circumnavigate ourselves, stopping at all the landmarks along the way, to examine their structure and influence. Upon completion of the journey, if we complete the journey, 
we will arrive at the center, where a lengthy recovery period ensues, our exhaustion fueled by the horrors we faced and magnified by the crushing gravity of the universe. If you manage to survive, it doesn't go unnoticed. It transforms you in a way that even without speaking, you communicate caution to predators and comfort to prey. You're not a monster, not quite, but the suit fits if need be. I suppose then that this gift, the ability to dance among devils without the fear of one cutting in, is a combination of self-awareness, experience, earned respect, and dangerous competence. Let's try to make that more concise and describe it as formidable, the gift of formidability. Now then, on to things that you may actually find in real life. Shields exist. You may even have one. And if you don't, you can just kind of like hold something up in front of you so it can protect you. That'll do the job. You can even polish one so it, you know, it's got like a mirror-like finish. In fact, you can just put a mirror on your shield and call it a day. Shields are interesting things. They are a form of protection you take with you into treacherous circumstances. The implication being that we mustn't avoid danger, we should simply prepare ourselves for it. Shields are also multi-iterative. An immune system is a shield. Mental defenses are a shield. So are friends and family, a house, hobbies and leisure time, and the list goes on. Something you may have noticed is that shields don't simply exist to reduce harm. They protect something far more valuable, an equilibrium or a state of moderation, whether it be physical, mental, or conceptual. The goddess of wisdom believes it prudent that Perseus carries with him a shield, and thus it would be probably wise to do so, as it would be wise for us to have many safeguards to protect the delicate balance of human order. Perseus isn't given a mirrored shield to maintain an equilibrium, though. He is literally facing down a monster. But this monster isn't the sort with which you can lock eyes. Doing so would result in the sort of death that would immortalize your lack of wisdom in the form of a statue, sort of like the Darwin Awards are in print. Some monsters cannot and should not be confronted directly, either because you do not possess the adequate strength to survive a struggle with it, or perhaps no human possesses such strength. It would be wise, then, to approach it carefully, perhaps when it is vulnerable, and use a tool to assess it indirectly. This isn't meant to encourage things like deceit or subversion. These may produce a somewhat favorable outcome, but it will not produce the value one would gain through an authentic victory. It may be strategic, but it is also cowardly. This is why it is often stated that cheaters only ever cheat themselves. The world, after all, is comprised of more than just one challenge or one game. And if you rely on outcomes that occur as a result of cheating, at some point, the diminishing returns of your strategy will become apparent, likely by the hand of someone more competent than you, and you'll have no one to blame but yourself. Wisdom is sort of difficult to define. I offered a take on it in my intro episode, which was the capacity to know when you're moving in the right direction of truth. But that isn't particularly concise or clear. If you search up the word online, You'll find descriptions that pertain to possessing knowledge and having good judgment. But what exactly knowledge and good judgment means is another matter, and not simply something that can be taken for granted. That's why I prefer to instill the concept of truth in my definition. Because I don't believe you can have wisdom without a particular interest in truth. Otherwise, how exactly are you able to exercise good judgment based on knowledge if what is on offer is at odds with reality? Certain things seem to be wise, especially quotes, which I've noticed are fairly popular on the internet, and whomever posts them is hoping to glean some credit by proxy of the wisdom the words impose, but I can't help but feel like they are aspirational, that is, not wisdom someone has yet attained, but rather something they hope to attain at some point. Perhaps there isn't much distance between aspirational and inspirational, or perhaps it's just wise to pursue wisdom if that's even just a little too cute. Now that I think of it, it would be fun to take quotes from the internet that are allegedly wise or profound, and dissect them to see if there's anything there. Perhaps I'll do that sometime. Maybe even with my own writing. 
Without digressing further, which appears to be a pastime of mine, let's say that the shield is not only supposed to represent wisdom because it was given by the goddess of wisdom, but also that it is how it is to be used offers insight into the notion that the most dangerous of battles should be fought strategically, especially when the beasts would likely kill you in a fair fight. Approach a monster in the wrong way, or at the wrong time, and you may lose your life. The shield is the gift of wisdom. So, we found a monster to slay, and whether it is by birth or through practice, we've equipped ourselves with the gift of resilience so we may complete the long journey to the end of the earth. The gift of formidability, so that along the way, regardless of what we encounter, we can evoke a sense of respect that will discourage those that stand in our way and endear us to those who may support us. We have experienced enough hardship and captured sufficient relevant knowledge that allows us to exercise judgment that is applicable to the scenario at hand. But that still leaves something important. The ability to pull the trigger. You'd think that being resilient, formidable, and wise would be sufficient to slay a monster. But you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, of how many gifted people just don't have the nerve to finish the job. What if you had something that would ensure your ability to carry out the deed? An item that is an extension of your talents, maybe, and a manifestation of your other gifts. An adamantine sword, sharp and pure, given to you by the king of the gods himself. For those unaware, adamantine is a term used to describe either an unbreakable object or a material, usually a metal, that can only be shaped by a powerful and skilled hand, and what is produced is generally considered, at least in stories, to be among the most resilient and strongest of objects. Well, what are we to do with such an item? It should be used to slay the deadliest of monsters, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the only suitable target for such a thing. Douglas Murray has characterized the modern obsession of finding dragons to slay as St. George in Retirement Syndrome, I believe that's the phrasing, who, after slaying all of the dragons in England, continues to swing his sword around in search of other dragons, because it is the only thing he knows how to do. It is his raison d'etre. The reason I mention this is twofold. First, it would be wise to remember that if you weld such a sword, that it should only be used to slay dragons. Your fellow humans, including those with which you disagree, are not a suitable target for your weaponry. You're overarming yourself so you don't need to cooperate or compromise. You're seeking to silence through intimidation. Second, someone or something isn't a dragon simply because you characterize them that way. Are you sure you aren't seeing monsters just so you have something to slay? Humans have a thirst for competition that can often manifest as a desire to destroy or control. Or perhaps it is your own sense of helplessness that translates into the sort of tyranny that masquerades as compassion. Regardless of whether you're gifted or forlorn, you'll need the ability, or perhaps the skill, to execute command beheading. Whether the obstacle is maintaining your composure, summoning the nerve, or submitting to the recognition of what you may become after the deed is done. They can be encapsulated rather elegantly with the concept of will. Do you have the power of will to weld the gifts or talents so that they may bear fruit? The sword in this case represents the mechanism with which Perseus can have his goal materialize after having arrived on the precipice of eternity. The adamantine sword is the gift of power of will, or maybe willpower, the manifestation of a hardened and focused mind that will carry the day in the darkest of places, unwavering and unbreakable in the belly of the beast, just like adamantine. It has been done. There we stand amongst the gruesome scene, transposed in new and unexpected ways. We're exactly where we've intended on being, but the unfamiliarity of it shatters any comfort we anticipated. We are a foreigner. The beast is slain, but we don't feel accomplished, or proud, or vindicated. We feel something, but we can't quite describe it. After a moment, 
we realize that it isn't the feeling that eludes us. Rather, it is the acceptance of our role as the force that reduces something to nothing from which we avert our eyes. The blinding horizon of an eclipse at the center of the universe draws near, and we are caught in the gravity of oblivion. It seeks to swallow us whole. Its warmth touches our face, oh so delicately, like a lover from a distant past, inviting the reconciliation for which we beg when no one is around to judge. You can have me, it whispers to you, not to our minds, nor our hearts, but to our humanity, and the twisted lust it promises is enough to make us sick in ways so sweet that they're only spoken about in jest. And we stand in between time and space, crying tears of joy so dense that they cease to fall. They simply drift in our orbit and puddle. They are the rain between which we walk. <sighs> you breathe in suddenly and your senses return you're standing with the beheaded creature at your feet, and despite your apprehension in carrying with you such a grotesque trophy, you scoop up the head of Medusa and place it in the metallic pouch and hastily leave the scene. On your return home, you begin to feel the weight of your burden from within the pouch, silent to the ears of all but you. The whispers of Medusa are still heard. What is it they say? I suppose that depends on the content of your character. Whatever it is, they speak not the truth. They reveal the ghosts that haunt you. And whether your gaze turns a court to stone, or you direct it towards bigger and even deadlier monsters, your actions convey your trajectory to all who bear witness, including yourself. The quote by Nietzsche that I began earlier, I'll share completely now. Whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster, and if you gaze into an abyss long enough, the abyss will gaze back into you. It's a relatively popular quote, you've probably heard it before. It finds its way into many circles and many conversations, but I can't help but feel like the majority of the times that it's discussed, it is done by those who have never seen an abyss, nonetheless gazed into one for long enough. It is one thing to study something or someone. It is yet another to have walked the walk, whether it be by choice or by circumstance. An important takeaway from this myth is that Perseus had to complete the journey and slay Medusa himself. The gods gave him gifts to be sure, but if they wanted to eliminate the prospect of failure, they could have just killed Medusa and given him her head. An interesting thing about the Greek gods, however, is that they believe that despite anything prophesized, it is up to the humans themselves to determine whether they are worthy of inheriting the earth. Whether you are born with gifts or talents, or you work for them, or you're given them, you alone must overcome adversity to achieve a desired end. Otherwise, it is undeserved. And it is only after a matter of time before someone who has conquered correctly will demonstrate that they are more worthy than you to reign over the upside-down kingdom. If you're able to retain authority in the face of someone more competent than you, it isn't an indication of your worth. It is a testament that the structure has been compromised, despite how your mind may be poisoned by your own justifications. The head of Medusa has become your burden, and your blessing. When you return from the end of the earth, you bring a part of it with you, something terrible and unwieldy that has become your unwitting parasite. As long as it is tethered to you, you have a responsibility to keep it at bay and wrestle it to the ground should it try to escape. Manage this, and it may yet serve you. You can keep it by your side. The pouch will keep it safe. It was given by the Hesperides, after all. The Hesperides, nymphs of the forest, are sort of difficult to describe. They're often ambiguous in literature, and when they aren't, how many nymphs make up the collective and their disposition varies greatly. There are even variations where Medusa is named as one of them. 
But this has internal contradictions, not only with the version I'm discussing, but internal inconsistencies with many other versions of many other stories, as is typically the case with stories in history, I suppose. A good way of looking at human history is as a tangled mess of incompatible stories, and every generation believes themselves responsible for parsing the good ones from the bad, and we all believe ourselves uniquely capable of doing it better than all of our predecessors. We are adorable! The most common depiction of the Hesperides are as a tripartite entity, a triad, a threesome, but not the sexy type, that is, unless you find archetypal figures in classical stories sexy, which I do, and it's why I have an erection right now. Three is often a number of significance in storytelling, and Greek mythology is no different, which also has the three fates and the three graces, and the number three generally represents wholeness or completeness, built upon three pillars, which has some variance across historical traditions. It is in this way that the pouch, given by the triad of nymphs, provides for the correct configuration of three traits upon which to build a sturdy and complete structure, resilience, formidability, and wisdom. If you maintain a balance of these three gifts, not only may you maintain the power of will to slay a monster, but you may yet be able to carry with you safely the power that this burden imposes. If you can maintain this equilibrium, you may become a force most foul to be reckoned with. But if the scales tip and one of them slips, you may become the force that demands a reckoning and wet your jaws for the world so that you may swallow it whole. The death of Medusa can represent growth through your conquer of her burden and the birth of the winged horse and a capable twin with a blade made of gold. Or it can create catastrophe through the disavowal of ethics and a loss of your humanity. This is the truth of Medusa. Well, that is all I have to say about Perseus and Medusa, at least for now, which I think is plenty. What I hope to do with this podcast is cast a gaze on us, all of us. Not that I intend on turning anyone to stone, well, at least not physically. There is a common human experience where, after being struck with an insight so clear and illuminating, it challenges everything we thought we knew about something, or maybe everything, and we flounder either looking to retreat or succumbing to the insight as it cuts right through our assumptions. I hope I'm not incorrectly assuming that we've all experienced this at least once in our lives, but my concern is that it doesn't happen nearly frequently enough. When does learning stop exactly? At which point in your life have you deduced that you have a good enough grasp on things that there is no more need for new information or new perspectives, the sort that still you to your core. So you have it all figured out then. Well, whether or not you believe this to be the case, I hope we can cooperate and cast our gazes at insight and transform our perceptions to stone so that they may be chiseled and shaped anew or rendered asunder and left as rubble in our wake, as some ideas should be. Thank you very much for taking part in story time. Coming later this month will be my conversation with Derek on mental health and depression. That is, if we can figure out our audio recording situation. I've been having some difficulties making my initial provider work for us, so I'm changing to another in hopes that it will record our audio conversation well enough so it may be shared. I will be releasing some more general episodes on philosophy, which will be spoken discourse from my website, such as Defining Philosophy, My Case for Logic, and Those in Rational Abstinence. That's it for this episode. This is Matt from the Medusa Metacast signing off. Until next time, viciously pursue truth with courage and kindness. Take care of yourselves and one another. Goodbye.